Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. My guest today is none other than the amazing Wes Hauk from the band Alluvial, who I know you've heard of him. He's been on this podcast before. We've had him on Riff Hard in the metal community, especially the extreme metal community. I think he's become something of a household name as one of the top guitar players in the scene right now and definitely one of my favorites and a really good friend. His band Alluvial just put out a song called Death is But a Door on January 12th, 2024. So that's just a few weeks ago and it is, uh, it's something, it's great. He's on tour right now also. Uh, Alluvial's on tour right now with Vela Maya and really cool guest co-host Spiro Ducias is on this episode as well. It's a good one. I'm going to stop talking. Let's just get into it. Here goes. Spiro and Wes, welcome back to the Riff Hard Podcast. Howdy. 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 I miss you both. You too, bro. Yeah, yeah. How have you been doing? Pretty good. It's been a, it's been a year. It's been a year. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you about this. Like, uh, the last few months have been kind of, kind of dark. And the thing that, uh, that always happens to me, like, is that when I finish a huge project, um, like I feel like an aimless piece of shit basically. And even if I tell myself I'm going to do this and this and that afterwards, like I can't fake it. Like, so when I finished the album, it was just like, I mean nothing. My life means nothing. Um, and it was, it took like a good couple months to like get back to normal brain function. Um, that happens after any big project, but I don't remember it being like this. I guess I haven't made an album in a while, but uh, I've noticed that you can't just fabricate uh, caring about something the same way, because when you make an album, you're so in everything and you become so disconnected from everything else. And like, it takes up so much of your brain ram that suddenly you're off it. It's almost like this weird withdrawal or something. So I'm wondering like, you guys get that? Like, I'm sure you do, Wes. Um, to some degree. There's, it takes time, like, you know, probably my happiest place is being in the church of guitar. We, me and, me and him talk about this all the time. Like, when you're in the church, church is done on a, typically on a, a six string guitar with tens and you know you're you're playing like in standard tuning yeah yes exactly yeah yeah in standard tuning and you're playing around like weird changes and um you're getting your head and your heart right and you're like putting time into reloading your barrels like with harmony and and mm -hmm. um with technique stuff that you may have had a problem with or whatever and then trying to find ways to make everything um uniform you know like things that you may have had trouble with like um i don't know like with with a technique you know like just trying to make everything sound uniform and volume and velocity that's the church um and when i'm working on stuff for the band while it is probably you know it's it's important it takes time away from the church um i realize i'm pretty sensitive to that um more than probably more than i've ever been covid was mad churchy you know like it was like mm -hmm. peak peak church other than being you know like a fucking kid and working on guitar constantly and being in the church and being in the church before you knew to call it the fucking church um but yeah i i i, I kind of get what you mean but maybe in the opposite effect i feel like the band thing in a lot of ways is ancillary to like the guitar part or like the becoming a better musician part you know um and for some people it's the complete opposite and for a while i thought that maybe that's where i would find like a a f full package feeling of fulfillment but it definitely isn't if i'm if i'm just sitting there and playing heavy metal shit you know i feel I feel like a an imbecile, 
You know what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. I feel like I'm not doing, I feel like I'm not towing the line. You know what I mean? So like, so, so even when I'm doing my heavy metal shit, I'm trying to, you know, do things that are wholesome on, you know, guitar. So like if, if I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm towing the line more, you know, you know, okay. So the past few months, the one thing that I have done was I decided, okay, since I have no like project thing, like overarching big picture, you're making an album. Like I'm just going to focus on myself and just focus on my playing and just focus on my musicianship. And I've been practicing my ass off for a few months and it's been great. Not like not band stuff, just guitar stuff. It's been really, really freeing, really liberating. Now I have to focus on band stuff again because we have to do stuff in like a month. But the last two or three months of, I guess that is the church, right? Of just focusing on stuff I want to focus on on guitar that is outside of the band that is just about me and the guitar getting better at the things that I don't feel so great at and uh, working on things that I've always wanted to work on, but that was unable to for whatever reason yeah that's kind of like the only state that i feel good in these days and i mean probably like you know over the, over the course of my life like when i'm at my happiest it's when i can just play guitar all day and make all of my goals things that only i'm aware of like there's something about like when you're working on something there's nobody else involved. You don't have to shit like you can show it to people, but you don't like there's no other external thing measuring your progress other than like how happy you are, or how sick it sounds to you. So like, you know, as far as the like post, you know, as far as the like musical postpartum depression thing, it's probably also a reason why it takes a long time for certain projects to get done. Like, I mean, I haven't, finished projects like you guys have in your respective musical careers. But I feel like part of it is probably that like when you're in that state, just making stuff and waking up every morning, drinking coffee and just going at it. Like it's almost like more fun to just maintain that as long as you can rather than being like, all right, it's done. And then, you know, but to your point, I mean, I guess it depends on how connected the, yeah, the church is to the actual music you're making, you know? Well, well, at some point, if you're going to like, I guess it depends on what level, how do I say this? I've been thinking about this a lot. It, the project you're working on, what you want to do with it, I feel like determines at what point you have to just like get it out, right? Like if you're on no a doubt. label, there's a deadline. And so you have to plan ahead really wisely to give yourself enough of that time to be able to explore things and not feel the pressure, which will make it not fun and kind of kills the art. But like you, you, if you're in that position, you kind of just, you have to accept that at some point you have to finish it. And so it is what it is. But so if you're doing it independently, um, I would still suggest that you give yourself that, you give yourself that sort of a deadline or like you do something involving someone outside of yourself that's going to, that's expecting it so that you just force, you force it because I don't, Wes, what do you think? I've noticed that whenever that happens, I hate it. Like I hate having to rush it. Like everything always gets rushed at the end, no matter how early I start, no matter what, because you could always work on it forever. But the, just the act of finishing it, handing it in and calling the thing done gives you the ability to look back on it and actually analyze how to get better as opposed to if you just keep it going forever you could ruminate on it forever and like iterate and keep on improving it but it's still there and it's not you can't do a post-mortem on it there's a few different parts it ends up being like what it is that you're um like what it is that you want to do with your band. And for me, that tends to be like writing, you know, songs and the whole 
three and a half, four and a half minute format and making them hopefully be these things that um, make chemicals and dopamine go off in someone else's head enough times in that four and a half minutes to where they want to listen to that song again. And that part, I feel like in a lot of ways has so little to do with the church it's you know what I mean? It's, it's the, the complete opposite. fucking opposite yeah. of the church. It is. Yeah. It is your goal when you're doing that. Is like you're you're a fucking drug dealer. Yep. You're sitting there and you're like, are, you're trying out your own shit and like seeing if it gets you high and then refining it from that point and then like you know giving it or selling it to somebody else and that typically is like a lot of restraint in a lot of ways. Um, the church is dealing to other dealers. Yeah, yeah, fair you know. enough. <laughs> yeah, um, and when it comes to, and and um, I like, I I like that part of, I I like songwriting, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I get better at it each time um, that we do stuff. But there's there's something somewhat unnatural about like the 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 tradition now of bands like it's like yep you better turn some shit around every two years um or else you know people will forget about you and that is true that's true i think it is pretty true to a degree and i mean i'm i'm proud in the sense that we were able to turn around this cp um two years after we put out a full length and i'd love all the shit on our ep it's but great, the idea way. of oh thank you um but but the idea of sitting down right now and doing another one makes me go like, I want to just sit in the church, you know, and and I want to like keep all the stuff that we've got toasty and go out and play it in front of people, you know, and that's that that sounds a whole lot more fun than being like, oh, OK, forcing myself to like make a bunch of like write a bunch of new songs. It feels like it's happening for the wrong reason in that regard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, like. But, <clears throat> I mean, it, it goes without saying. It's definitely true. You have to turn shit around in a pretty timely manner these days. You kind of have to put shit out every six months, you know? Um, so whether that's just, like, getting a single or, um, I don't know, coming up with some new way, it seems it seems like that's the, that's the important thing to do. And, I mean, if and when the moment comes where you become a band that's like really really fucking busy um and you're going out and you're making a lot of money touring and you kind of don't stop that would probably be even more stressful for me like like i guess in that regard like when you when you look at like someone like Lorna Shore right now, like they're just going oh, a yeah. fucking that thousand miles an hour right now. They're just going boom, just humming down the highway. And they have not stopped since 2021, since since that To the Hellfire song came out. They've just been fucking gunning it. And I'm just like, they got a full length done somewhere in there. And the idea that they would have to right now go like, oh shit, our our last one's been out for a year. We better fucking start thinking about a new one. And they haven't really been home. Um, that's high stress. And I think that there's, there's, there ends up being like a pretty small amount of people that end up having to pull that off. And when you do, you probably figure out some things about yourself. And you probably, you know, either hate your band more or love it more, you know? It's not for everyone, but at the same time, it, when I see something like what's going on with them, I ask myself, what would anyone in their right mind do other than what they're doing? It, it's unless you don't want, unless you don't want what's at the other, on the other side of that rainbow, basically like if, if the thing that I think it'll make you learn about yourself that might not be what you meant, but for me, the thing that that will make you learn about yourself is how bad you actually want want it. Because the level of intensity of what a band like Lorna Shore is going through right now, um, and the amount that they're going to have to dig deep to write another record and to just keep it going, and the toll that 
that level of activity will have on a personal life, on health, like on everything that I think that what you'll learn about yourself is what's actually important to you. I think a lot of people learn um, that it's not important to them. They thought it was, but it's not. And maybe there's another aspect of music that is important to them. And then some people learn, no, this is what they were meant to do. And they just keep going. Um, but I think that's the thing you'll learn is like, is this really for you? You learn, but I'm saying like the, the, I guess the distinction I'm trying to make is that like the absurd notion that someone should in that two year period of going out and going a thousand miles an hour should turn around something that is an upgrade from the thing that they just previously put <laughs> that's out. How, it's that's fucking, how Metallica, it's, yeah, that's how yeah, Metallica yeah, gave yeah. us load. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I mean, they they eventually were just like, I yeah, I want to end up being a rock band or something. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it's a little ridiculous. I mean, you know, there's a whole cliche of like, you know, first album takes ten years, second album two months, kind of thing. <laughs> but it is asking a lot to go through all that and suddenly get back into creative mode just like that well yeah yeah i mean there's there's this there's this some there's this level of i guess like hunkering down and rationing technique for some sort of friendly one-upmanship on your next record or whatever that seems to be this thing with metal it always has been um and like you know um that's the part of it i guess you just end up keeping you 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 keep on doing that and try to stay enough spend enough time in the church where you can feel good about yourself um and feel like whatever it is that you ended up turning turned around was you know looked and sounded like you 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 spent the time in the church too you know that that's a, that's a tough one to do i mean dude fucking a when i think about it too like a lot of my friends some of them being on their like seventh or eighth full length as a band um it's a lot you know it's a lot of fucking full lengths like it's a lot of songs quite a few uh, um definitely more than like some of the most heralded metal bands like i mean like when you think about it metallica like all in all i'm i'm, I'm i might get flamed for saying this but metallica's really got like four records yes they've got four the rest yeah. of them are like and it started at ride the lightning if you ask me fair fair, fair yeah fair. i'm with fair. you all right the, so let's say five Pan let's pantera's say five. pantera has three pretty <laughs> much you know what i mean yeah. they've got three um slayer has the most out of everyone in my opinion slayer has like fucking six of them like that are all like mute like that were all slayer that, albums that had an indelible mark on music and changed it and you know all that other stuff um yeah no like that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of that you know but i guess if if you sit there and and you can crank out three or four of them that are meaningful you know what i mean like um, that seems to be enough to capture people's imagination. Um, not that I'm saying that you, you should stop there or try to stop there, but like who out, out of, out of all three of us, um, are just put on the new Metallica record every fucking day. You know what I mean? <laughs> or, the or, last, at all. or the last, <laughs> or the last like four of them, you know? It, <laughs> oh, man. how many of us are doing that how many of our friends are doing that you know what i mean like there's definitely some karate teacher you know what i mean who's putting on the new metallica <laughs> record in his dojo and shit <laughs> why is that so fucking funny because <laughs> you know what it is he's he's in there and he's just like He's like, like in doing between that and, God and stuff, and he's got the fucking, he's got the new Metallica record on in the background. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> That's fucking Those hilarious. Yes, I know. The tones, bro. 
I know exactly <laughs> what that is. No, you're right. I haven't even listened to it. And I don't have anything I don't have anything against them, of course, but like I haven't listened to it. Um haven't been drawn to it. And no, you're you're right. It's a lot of this, a lot of everything that we're saying right now to like the untrained ear would come off as sounding sanctimonious. Like I'm not sitting here and and proposing that I would know what it was like to be Metallica for the last 40 years. You know what I mean? Like, holy fuck, they just had to make decisions and roll with them. And, and it would appear that just about every decision that they've made is has, has been one that, that worked out, you know, despite the fact that it may not like serve the people who really love like the early records and all the things about the early records you know i guess what i'm what i'm trying to say is, is it's that balance of trying to feel like i'm in the church of guitar but also like being able to write music for a band and make it to where um more and more people are into that and and it's not just because of the guitar thing you yeah. know what i mean it's it's because of like a a song thing an emotional thing you know well, there's a there's like a threshold because you're you know if you hit that point where you're fucking opening for gojira and stadiums and people are like there to go crazy about your music suddenly you're like all right like i'm pretty sick of guitar like you know what i mean like you're like yeah i'm good but like it's then there's also probably a point where you're like lugging cabs up the stairs at Reggie's and you're like, fuck, I, I could be like, you know, like working on something right now, you know, like, like there's like, I imagine it's, is it, is it above, is it above the threshold to where like you're fulfilling the childhood dream of playing like, you know, monsters of rock in Moscow or is it like, it's really just like, is it about the guitar or is it about like writing metal songs? And I imagine that is like a sine wave, you know what I mean? Like that probably goes up and down like, like anything, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the, I guess the, the amount of people that end up in metal being able to like, play amphitheaters you know what i mean like, like ends up being small a smaller and smaller thing and like i guess in if and when right like whenever the day comes that like metallica ends up not to being a band that tours anymore like thinking about it and it's just a weird way to think about it like it like how big of a blow that will be to the economy of like <laughs> heavy metal music you right. know what i mean like there it's just like this gigantic thing that brought a fucking shitload of people to a place every time that they went there and it employed a whole bunch of people as well you know what i mean like their crew plus like local crew and everything and it's, it's also it gets like other like what people would consider huge bands able to be playing stadiums opening for them yes exactly support acts that would develop like, i guess uh you know seeing it although i've heard that like if you go and eat from people who who played with Metallica, they're just like, yeah, it's a novelty thing. No one gives a fuck that you're there. <laughs> like people are out in the in the in the parking lot drinking beer. Um, they say and, that, but look at the bands who have done it that we know of: Gojira, Lamb of God, Ice Nine Kills. Those, those are bands, those are recent. You know what I mean? Well, I guess Gojira. Gojira and Lamb of God are not recent, but like Gojira did that for a while. Did there were like those two years or something. I don't remember exactly, but there was a long time where Gojira were opening for Metallica. That was just like what they were doing. And look at him now. But I mean, it's an exception, right? Like that level of success for a band that heavy is just not something normal. But yeah. And Lamb of God was already successful when they did that. But I don't think that's novelty but i know what you're talking about there are i have heard this before that that it doesn't do as much for your career as you would think it does but i've heard that mostly from people who have done it once or played like their festival or something like that like that it did that that one time with metallica or the two shows or something didn't equal much but i don't know when you do more than one like a tour and then another tour and then another tour and then another tour like 
I mean, not very many bands get that. And the ones I know of who have done that, like, I mean, look at them now kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there's this new book that James Hetfield put out, um, unrelated to like the, what we're kind of talking about with the business side of like, you know, getting bigger as a middle band. He put out this book called messengers and it's like this big, thick ass coffee table book. Um, and like a chronological timeline of all of his most famous guitars, like, like all the way down to the, from starting with that Electra V that was a Gibson copy to like the first couple of explorers, like the more beer and the so fucking what explorer and all that other stuff into the ESP stuff and all the Zematis guitars and everything like that. Um, and like, it's, it made, it was like, God, this is exactly how you do it. This is the shit. And it's by James Hetfield. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like every paragraph you're reading in there is from him, unless it says like, Oh, there's, this is a paragraph from Ken Lawrence talking about, you know, th this Explorer that he built or this V or whatever. And then there's a few lines in there from his tech, that guy Chad and everything. And there's this small section towards the end of it. Um, that's about the amps. And, um, he clears up like a lot of stuff that's been like the, the crunch berries, like two C plus. Yeah. yeah. Everyone always said that, that was a two C plus. It is in fact a two C plus plus. And he talks about in there how, how they both, that was the, the first two amps that they got from Boogie. There's like James got a C plus and Kirk got the C plus plus. And then James eventually ended up taking that head from Kirk and that head has been on every Metallica record since the Crunch Berries one. Um, it's that and some super lead Jose modded thing is, yeah. you know, like the main thing. And then, of course, like the diesels and all that other stuff before. But um, those pictures, you know, those ones you sent me of like the, the racks. Yeah, yeah. There's these the the triaxis rack and then that puppets rack with the yeah. the marks and then the strategy four hundreds. Yeah. Those are still intact. Those are still racked. You told up me this. As if they like you like you could literally pull them out and plug them in and shit. They're still in a warehouse is like from those tours, which is fucking radical too. It it also seems like there's there's people involved at that Metallic HQ that are like involved in making sure that they document everything. Like there's this part in there on that Electra V where he had like that guy, Zach Harmon, who's been like their long time, like go to dude. There's this part in there on the Electra V section of the book where he talks about how they restrung it for something on death magnetic. And they heard this pop and the fucking tailpiece broke. And there's all <laughs> these pictures. It was almost like they were like, stop history moment and then they like took <laughs> pictures of everything that just happened and um you know i guess all of them had the foresight to think that you know this could end up in a fucking book someday that people would want to read i mean me being one of them i would highly recommend it. it's like 80 oh, bucks on amazon you gotta bro, get yeah I'm, I'm getting that yeah that's For anyone I, who's anyone who's listening to this or watching this right now you'll love that book it's fucking incredible yeah dude like we were talking about this recently how that sound that they kind of, I mean, as far as like taking this just piece of engineering in like those Mark series heads in the late eighties and just taking the 750 slider and going to zero with it, like that scoop sound in E standard, which is like a crucial part of this, like that, like, I feel like, doesn't get talked enough about how like crucial that was to what ended up being 30 more years of like metal mixing and dialing in tones. And what's funny is that as tuning started getting lower and lower and lower, like in the nineties and early two thousands, there was like a period where people would try to dial shit in the same. They'd be like, all right, well, we're in, we're in a flat, but we still love, pull in the mids and it eventually became a thing to where people just started adding a ton of mid range back in to be able to hear their double drop C eight string riff. But 
when you go back and you just take that five band EQ and just give it the V shape, a six string guitar and E standard because of like where the fundamental frequencies are in the spectrum is like <clears throat> as heavy to me as a seven string and G with a ton of mids. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what it's a weird thing. Explain your theory on how that whole Mark series slaved into strategy 400 is the reason why the rectifier exists. That's, oh, that's a crazy theory. He has, he figured something out. Well, I, I mean, you don't want to give no. away everything that you know, but like he figured something out. The, the strategy well, 400 is this fucking, I mean, you remember him. It's a, it's a, like a four U power amp that has like yeah. 12, six L sixes in it. It's fucking, it's enormous. You know what so, I mean? There's a lot, you know, I don't know everything about this. And as far as the rectifier goes, the preamp section is very different on a rectifier than on a Mark series. But as far as, so as I understand it, that power amp, well, okay, back up. I guess around like the Puppets tour, one of their earlier tours, they had C pluses. And I think they either wanted to run more cabs or just James just wanted like more power. And they were like, but well, we have this hi-fi system power amp that was designed for like, you know, people playing records out of hi-fi speakers that had a ton of headroom, like fuck ton more wattage and headroom than the power amp of a, you know, of a tube head. Because back then people, you know, the, the for example, the rhythm tones on like And Justice For All or the Black Album, that kind of just like ging, 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 transient, like didn't, it wasn't really a thing. Like people wanted... Like everything kind of sounded a bit smeared before that, you know, like even like heavy records just kind of sounded like they were in a toaster, you know, and a lot of that did come from the power amp too. Like you had these marshals that were just being pushed to their limit. And um, I guess what happens is they, so Boogie sent them, they're like, oh, check this out. You might like it. And the power amp on that thing will like never distort. You're never going to hit the ceiling of that thing. So it just, everything comes out so articulate and like offensive, you know? And I think that eventually became the sound of, you know, just that much attack and, and that much just like, yeah, relentless um, kind of, it's just like a punch that you like wouldn't get out of, you know, overloading a power amp on an 80 watt <clears throat> head or something. And the triple rectifier, apparently, I don't remember, I, don't, I gotta like go back and check the details about this, but like in the 90s when they introduced the rectifiers, the triple had 150 watts. And from what I understand, it's the headroom of it and like the way it behaves is actually really similar to the strategy because basically they were like, oh, okay, you're using this thing that's designed for a hi-fi system. Let's eventually like make one that's made for a guitar or whatever. Then they started making the rectifiers and the triple had all this extra headroom. And I mean, that's what they, a lot of people ended up using in the nineties, but yeah, I think there was definitely, I definitely think Metallica's like engineering, but their team, their tech and just them, like, I think they had one of the largest impacts on what would eventually become like metal tone. Um, obviously, I mean, that that sounds like, trivial, like a lot of people would credit them for that. But as far as like getting under the hood and getting a, you know, a, a chug on a guitar to sound almost like a drum, you know, um, back then when it was all analog. Like, <clears throat> I, would, I would not be surprised if that's correct, especially the, because of how that camp operates. Oh, like, yeah. that camp. I mean, dude, it's, it's camp literally is serious. That camp is serious about everything. The, the triple rec is like, it is six, you know, six L6s or EL34s, whatever you're going to pop in there, and three rectifier tubes. So it's like half. It's literally half of a strategy 400. Um, yeah, so well, strategy is supposed to be stereo, two of them. That's yeah, the idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. There we go. They call, they literally, well, yeah, because eventually they, they, they had this other power amp when they discontinued the strategy they made this thing for like a brief second you can't really find it but it's called the coliseum and they advertise it as two triple rectifier power sections that's like what it says on mace's website so it just made me go huh like mm. him slaving the preamps of those mark heads into that thing and you can i mean when you really get into it you can hear the difference i mean if you listen to like 
you know, ride the lightning or any of the earlier stuff. It definitely doesn't have that. Like, like, yeah, yeah. you know, did but, he ever switch to triples? Yes. Uh, okay. Load and reload actually, which those in my opinion, I mean, say what you want about the music though. I I'll no, defend those sound, records. The sound is great. Yeah, dude, like those tones, because that was eventually they started going tri-axis <clears throat> into the strategy. And that to me is the holy grail of metal guitar tones with the, they had like custom five band EQs made that were like the same circuit as their C plus heads. After um, the power amp? In between. So, so it was, it okay. was, yeah, tri-axis, five band strategy. And God. And that's all, <clears throat> and that's an EQ that's like doing a different thing because it's running from like plate voltage rather than mm -hmm. like a fucking yes. nine volt battery yes. or some exactly. fucking direct current thing. So this it's doing is, different shit. Yep. Yep. This is the thing. Like those people will buy it. Like Mesa makes a five band pedal to emulate the whatever's on the heads. But uh, because the, especially the old ones had, you know, that that circuit's being powered, the EQ is being powered by the actual head. And when you m fucking move those sliders like a millimeter, it corresponds to like 4 dB. So when you pull yeah. that 750 to zero, you're making like such an insane like cut. Like if, if there was a, someone should make a plugin that is just a, a, a like a modern like fab filter style, like visual representation of what a Mark series boogie eq does because it's like such extreme um amounts of gain but yeah the pedals have like a lot less of it like they're not nearly as extreme when you try to go for it but yeah those sounds yeah the the uh the the boogie thing is i think for a while especially like we talked about this like like five years ago no one i mean fucking no one gave a shit about a revision G or revision rec <laughs> F rectifier or anything like that. Or, <clears throat> or, or really like, well, no, I should say the two C pluses have always been in demand, but like, um, now people have gotten, gotten wise to like the, the f magic of vintage boogies. And that's why they're all insane now. Like, like, um, like a 2C plus a DRG, like the Coliseum one, like that will go from anywhere from like 11 and a half to 14 grand now. Yeah. Um, and there's, like you said, when you hear people play, like when they dial in a mark, which is, you know, arguably one of the like trickiest amps to dial in ever, they like get there like, 80%, maybe 70% with the head itself, but there's power amp distortion yep. on the, the 2C that doesn't happen when you put it into the strategy 400. And that's where it's like, it's like that. Shoom, 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 shoom. Like you don't hear anything. Like it stops and starts. Like, yes. Yeah. It's you know the what speed. I mean? yeah. yeah. The speed of the full frequency spectrum yeah, yeah, moves yeah. as just this, like, yeah, it's, do, it's a thing. Do you think that neural, and Bogren Digital, because you know Bogren Digital did the Rev C, and then Neural just put out that Mesa stuff like maybe a year ago. Um, you know, we made some videos on that with Sir Spiro that are great. But like, do you think that the amp sim companies suddenly, at the same time, putting out very Mesa oriented stuff is part of people remembering how sick? this stuff is definitely or, or do you think that it's a result of people remembering like was the was were people starting to remember prior to that and then the plug-in companies were like let's get on this or did the plug-in companies put that stuff out and then the guitar community was like wait a second these are actually pretty cool no i think it's from a a, a, a small batch of people like making everyone realize that they're sick and cool. And then like plug in companies probably responding. I'm actually not aware. Like Neural put out a Mesa thing. Oh, they put out the two C thing. Never mind. Yeah. 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 I mean, no, that's, uh, that's gotta, a hundred percent gotta be why. I mean, like, um, 
I guess who are the most notable two C guys like Steve Lukather, Mate- James Hetfield, probably fucking Petrucci. Um, yeah. Lamb of God yeah. used to play them, right? Mark Fours, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. played Mark yeah. Fours. I still think, I still think like the vast majority of, of anyone who's like turned on that neural plug in like, and, and to be fair, they are really unintuitive amps to dial in. Like you've got to do things that just, well, if they just watch your videos, yeah, they'll know how to use them. Like even like Wes and I were, you know, we both recently unrelated, both just like got back into fractal audio world. Um, and we've been like hanging, just dialing in some sounds. And I was like, all right, I need you to like get the, the boogie thing happening. And every time you had like gone for it before there is a psychological element towards like, well, I shouldn't have this knob here. It just doesn't look right. So I'm like, not going to do it, but it's like, you got to do it. You got to do things that look dumb. And then it just turns on. What do you know? Yeah. Yeah. There is, there's the whole thing with like basically feeding the rotary knob section into the five band section and yeah. that each one of those things end up being a form of clipping into it, you know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, I I had a Mark III for a little bit, and he showed me kind of how to get around on it. Um, and on, like, the, the Axe FX front, um, you know, like, they... It's like a raw as fuck pro audio tool. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, if you're looking for something that's just going to be like, yep, I want to plug in... That's very cool. That sounds good. I'll take it from here type of thing. I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend getting into, you know, like probably probably the QC or 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 any of Neural's plugins. I mean, every time you turn one of those on, it's like, oh, fucking A, that sounds cool. Like, I, like most of the work's done for me. Like, I think they do a lot of shit under the hood, whereas the Axe Effect is like, like, <laughs> you know, in a Play. lot of cases, yeah, it's, it's like you got to yeah. fuck around to get in there and figure out what's going on. But it is it is it's pretty dense and also it is a fucking beast like in terms of io and it's real real stable i had a fucking you're talking about the new one the three i had a nightmare run on this last tour with the fucking camper which was like kind of traumatizing like i'll never play on uh, it's a like. There's a lot of things I think that happened. Um, I mean, you gotta. You can't just drop that bomb and not give us some detail. Like, well, our bass player um, was running external MIDI. Oh, no. he he's he's this, uh, this already made my beat my blood pressure go up. He's 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 an, he's a rascal. You know what I mean? He 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 started. He was running external MIDI and he was bricking the Kemper and. Um, that uh i don't know if you remember when the kemper when the fucking thing crashes you got to turn it off and it takes a minute and 21 seconds 28 seconds to turn back on Mm -hmm. um and you know like it was there's a lot of shit about the kemper that is um great like the gates work great i mean obviously you can take a picture of something right when you you know what i mean and then and then you fuck with a few filters afterwards as like a computer it's not super robust the converters and shit like that aren't aren't super great either um so like the x effects just is it's diesel you know what i mean it's a fucking it you know it has four stereo outs on it so like where's the kemper right like i i've cabs just for me live you know and in order to run two cabs into a stereo power amp you either have to use an aby box and go dual mono which is fucking lame or you can um you you have to take the monitor out and then take the send out of the effects loop and feed the other side of the power amp. So then you don't have an effects loop anymore, provided you wanted to have one. Um, and I don't like these options. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, so I just, I, I, uh, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how to, how to make this thing work. Um, and it's great. I think the, <clears throat> like, ultimately, all, you know, anyone who's in like a, a spot where my band is like you kind of had to have a small 
rig that you know can get out of everyone's re- way real fast i mean obviously i would love to have a fucking sick stereo amp rig but it's just not practical for us right now so this is great it's perfect the xlr switching thing too instead of the, oh yeah yeah instead yeah. of an ethercon yeah that's another thing ethercon like you know what i mean like the connection that's on the kemper it's like a connection that you'd have on your fucking modem router, router for yeah. your house you know what i mean it's like not sturdy um and you also had to use a poe power over ethernet thing if you're gonna if you have a downstage loom um you know like that's over 20 feet long you had to fucking use a poe which is like a boosts power along the way um whereas the axe effects like it's just a straight up xlr cable boom you know that's great yeah um a lot of people don't know that you can use standard cables for a lot of different things yeah you don't yeah, have, i mean they, I a lot of them could do, do the MIDI. same shit you could do midi over xlr i didn't yeah, really yeah. realize that yeah. we used yeah. to do that um back when we brought our own lights um we also you know always been in the position of having to get off stage quickly so we just bolted them onto our cabs and in order to be able to get the you know stuff across the stage to work with uh, the light, uh, the light box that was hooked up to the computer, we had a we had a converter that went MIDI to XLR, basically. Also, yeah. I'd like to point out that everything that we just talked about, while interesting, are all things that take you away from the church. Yeah, every single fucking thing that we're talking about right now, like like setting up a rig and making sure that it's gonna fucking work, and like. Make sure that you understand how, like, you know, gain staging works on your amp, and, you know, all this other shit. Like, while while fascinating and fun takes you away from, well, like, playing, playing and improvising yes. and all that other shit. This reminds know? me of something Emil said, actually, back in the day that I still remember. And I respect the shit out of it. And, uh, like, I think it's a good, like... It's a good thing for everyone to keep in mind. It's like one of the wisest things I've ever heard from any guitar player. Um, Back then, you know, I was, I had the home studio, which is where we did a lot of work and he'd come over and we'd work together on shit. And um, I would be like, why don't you get like a, an M box or something like learn like some basic pro tools or something. He was like, I don't want to fuck with that stuff. It's like, why? He's like, because it's going to take me away from guitar. Like, you do that stuff. I'll, I don't want to do, and he just told me, I don't want to do anything that's going to even take 15% away from the main thing, which is like, okay, I mean, proof is in the proof's in the pudding, right? Like, um, the way that dude plays and played is just insane. And so above like what's expected from a guitar player and uh and like he made very deliberate decisions to not get distracted by other things and so yes and now, i don't know if it's different now i'm sure I'm sure he's got some way to do demos now but like in 2008 and 9 and 7 he was not jumping on the train um sp- while a lot of other people were specifically for for that reason is it's going to take me away from the thing that matters. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure like I, I talked to him recently and he's like, eventually, you know, probably going to put together an in-ear thing, you know what I mean? For the Verlorn or stuff. And like that, it's obviously requires some sort of learning, learning curve. Right. Because when you do all this shit for your band, right. And you're putting all your, you're, you're putting all this shit together to where you can hopefully put on, like a good enough presentation and a con- like what that will be consistent in like 30 40 minutes every day that like um you can be proud of yourself and then the other part of it is that maybe other people would obviously think it was sick so like in the beginning stages you know no one else is going to give a fuck about it but you so you had to spend time learning it yeah and i mean like the same thing um it's almost like I'll pick certain days of the week where I'm like, all right, I'm going to spend time on this rather than, you know, 
um, spending all my time on it and spending like five days not in the church, you know. Um, if you were to, the amount of times that we've said church in this fucking podcast, if you were to clip it, you know. <laughs> Non-denominational. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah. you, you have, like you said, you have certain days of the week that you're going to spend on all this extra stuff or you pepper it in throughout the week or what? I'll usually spend Mondays and Tuesdays. Mondays and Tuesdays are kind of like my Saturday and Sunday. I teach from Wednesday to Sunday every every week. And then like Mondays are like usually when I like go and like I have to like ship something out or do something, I'll do that. But like those are the days where I'll go and figure out like, all right, I've got a fucking ground problem here. Like, oh, I got to like, you know, do something to our rigs those are the days that i end up doing it because i mean even teaching while it's sick you're not really spending a lot of time in the church yourself you know what i mean like it's it's you're the priest but it's like (laughs) yeah but it's almost like you're like yeah i mean although i'm sure you have like i'm sure everybody's student list is going to be different like i'm sure you have some students where you get to dig into shit that you are like stoked for sure about, yeah right um yeah it definitely depends i, I was gonna say one quick thing on that amel comment there was also another i don't know if he meant it at all like this but there's also the element of that specifically around recording like learning to be proficient in a daw and, and know your way around there's also the element of like and we've all seen it play out over the past decade like the better you get with that the higher of a likelihood it is that you are going to be less incentivized to rely on your guitar playing when you can aid it with like you know tricks right can, right right like that and I, that's like a big one that it's you know it's a small thing Dude, but you it, are such an anomaly by the way let me just say like who? you in in what regard in that like you're sick at recording and like a legitimate legit engineer that like knows their shit and is uh competent in it like not just like some some like bedroom hack with it and then you're also great at guitar like you don't normally see those two things together it's usually like great at guitar and like can plunk away a demo or great at recording but like maybe better than some of the people you record on guitar, but not like great at guitar. You don't normally see really, really sick at both. So sorry to cut you off oh, and uh, you no, know, like I'm, fondle I you appreciate, for a little bit. I appreciate it, bro. I mean, that's definitely the goal. I, w- I would say I definitely think because I grew up right as like the DAW was taking off as a thing that was kind of expected of you if you wanted to like be a metal guitar player. It was just kind of expected that like, in 2012, you buy Superior Drummer and an Axe Effects and like just do it all. Like you just learn how to like do that. And I definitely remember getting super into like really rhythmically crazy stuff and playing everything on a low seven string and like learning how to program drums and everything. I remember a few years went by and I was like, God, when's the last time I like played like guitar? Like when's the last time I like, like, you know, five years before that I was playing like Holy Wars, you know, I was just like playing in front of a Marshall that I didn't know how to dial in and just like playing all day. And I definitely think I like tried to make a point where I was like, Oh, right. Okay. I see that the more time you spend here, the less time you spend here. And uh, I definitely tried to like overcorrect by doing like big, like chunks of five years of my life, just kind of obsessed over, I guess, each of those things. Um, But I mean, yeah, I don't know. That's definitely the goal. And I appreciate if it comes off as that it's working or whatever, you know, but comes off that way. But I I think in general though, it's good to pick a lane. Yeah. Uh, It's good to pick a lane, at least as the main focus, I think for most people, unless they're capable and willing to like do what you did, which is five years I'm going all in on this thing. Okay. Five years later. All right. Now I'm going all in on this other thing while keeping this, the skills up on. It's certainly like an did. obsessive compulsive psychology. Like, like, you know, it's not, it's definitely like there's a certain 
there are definitely people that are oriented to, towards things like that. It doesn't feel as much, put it this way. It doesn't feel like a choice, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's 100% true to that, like, um, around somewhere around 2008, 2000 to 2012, there was this massive renaissance where it became inexcusable to not know how to record yourself and understand um, how to how to fucking make some respectable demo of you know your music to where wh whether that was showing that to your other people in your band to get them excited about a song or um you know being able to just do it for somebody else like the reason like you know largely the reason that you have guitars behind you and you're sitting in front of a computer that i imagine has monitors and there's some sort of guitar device whether it's an axe fx or a camper or whatever and he is too is because of that 2008 2012 time frame you know what i mean because yeah. back then back then it was not still it was still very common to go on myspace and like find some like crusty ass band with some shitty recording you know in their garage on their one of those MySpace like zoom player. handheld things in the middle of the room yeah 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 and then not that's now like inexcusable and you will find like a 14 year old kid talking about the finer points of like you know a fet style compressor which i think is which i think is a little much sometimes i'm just like hey come on calm down buddy <laughs> that's dude I, uh, i'm gonna show my age but i kind of predated that quite a while my first computer rig that had guitar inputs was like 99 and like was home recording by like 2000 um so by the 2008 time period where I started to see M boxes coming around and guitar pro becoming a thing and like all that, I was like, Oh, better, uh, or figure out what's happening here. Cause, um, there's about to be a flood of shit. Yeah. Um, which is, which is what happened for a while that actually going through the time period before that, and then seeing that happen is part of where, um, I got the idea to start URM was because suddenly it was becoming a thing that everybody would record themselves. And it's like, if someone doesn't fucking step up and show them how to do it, like we, this genre yeah. is in, in some trouble because the quality is about to take this massive, massive dip. None no of doubt. the old guys are going to show anybody anything. Cause they're all a bunch, they're all like resource guarding. And right. uh, no school is going to show them how to do it. So uh, I'm just give it a shot. But like that, uh, that is a very real thing when that happened. Um, and I'm glad that it happened because the alternatives before that were terrible. They were terrible and there were ripoffs. Like either, yeah, recording with that Zoom thing in your practice space or going to some local studio right. where you're getting charged $50 for a burned CD even like being ripped off by someone that doesn't even know how to record metal, like the worst demos ever at local studios. Um, I, I was really glad that the home recording revolution basically happened and yeah. that we're in such a better place now. Holy shit. We are such in, we are in such a better place now as far as it comes to quality in music and, ability to make music um yeah there's some things about the current age that are tougher than before but when people say it was better before they are not they are that's coming from the perspective of people who either weren't alive back then and don't know or from people who were in that tiny tiny percentage who got past the gatekeepers in like right. the 90s and managed to like have a successful career but it was way harder back then. Yeah. The, the only thing that I would say that I like, I think the end result, like the product that gets out now is just undoubtedly just so much. The, the, just the quality control has raised so high. The only thing I was commenting on is like, I just feel like the, if you were a guitar player and you played rock or metal in 1993, 
you felt, I feel like you probably felt more like a guitar player as the guitar was the thing that you did every day, rather than I am a music factory that give me a DAW, a guitar, plugins, sure. uh, a social network, you know, uh, whatever. It's so it's just, I just feel like it's, it's morphed a little bit into uh, like, yeah, it's just, it's just changed a little bit. So um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to re recognize that and be like, right, try to be connected to the guitar in such a way that the only way to get on a record would be to be like prepared and perform well and then have somebody capture that or whatever. It's to the point where you go back and you listen to records that you thought sounded really, really fucking slick, like puritanical, you know, like, like yeah. I remember, I mean, everyone kind of remembers when you heard that record for the first time, you were just like, this is insane. You know what I mean? Like this sounds perfect. And you go back and you listen to that now and you can hear like little subdivision-y stuff on the kicks that wasn't like totally like yep. perfectly divided and gridded and everything. So in that regard, um, yeah, it's like it's it's made it to where there's – it's made it when you hear something crazy. It's made you – I mean, at least me most of the time now. I'm like – all right, that's pretty cool. Like I, I kind of like 50, 40 percent believe that that's real. You know what I mean? And right. and 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 that's not me being a hater. It's just like it's obviously gone to this point where it's it's lost its its magic because there's just so many people who have you know completely slick, perfect you know airtight shit on their records, um, and that previously was a product of like spending time in the church it, exactly that's yeah. the thing like it used to require the church to do all of these things and, yeah, and yeah now it's about like how do you like get yourself to like still value that yeah i agree space, i right? agree with you however don't you think that there's more crazy guitar players now than ever it did they're, they're, they're 100 there is that effect to him specifically you know what, what i'm mean? saying he's a product of he's a product of hearing and you know music and thinking that that was you know how it was done and and he figured out how to sound like that i mean and i mean i think the generation before him and him also yeah same type of thing so it it definitely has like this um percentage of like like it, it's yielded a positive result but you know on the on the whole yeah it is because you have to do all these things now um and like i said in order to be a guitar player nowadays you have to be pretty good at audio you know what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be proficient with audio and you kind of have to be good at video now. You know what I mean? Like you gotta fucking know how to, you gotta have premiere or something like that. You gotta get a camera. You gotta have a fucking light. You know what I mean? Um, or a couple lights. Uh, and yeah, you're going to do a podcast. You know what I mean? Like you gotta, like, you can't just do it with your bullshit ass built in microphone, you know, <laughs> anymore. Like you got, I got this going in here and then I've got loop back is a c audio scene that zoom is seeing and shit. And like that all was stuff that took me like several days, if not a week to figure out each time. You know what I mean? It was like, right. oh, fuck, this is a problem. Oh, I got to spend time. I got to find someone who's going to be on Zoom with me for a second to see if this works. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And then, so, um, yeah, the eventually, right? Probably, probably in like another 20 years, AI will probably be good at making music. You know what I mean? Like, it'll probably be good enough at making music and, um, it Might may be a lot faster, dude. It may it may render it may render all of us like fairly obsolete. Um, if not for like maybe like there'll be like a new field of like 
forensic audiology. You know what I mean? Where like someone <laughs> like deep fakes and shit like that come around and they're like, you need someone who's like really knows about audio to be able to hear whether or not like, ah, oh, that's kind of like, you can tell that's fake. And right. Know. Right. Um, I mean, if, if that happened, I've always thought though, that if it gets, cause I mean, I tend to think that's even coming sooner. I think there's yeah, going to be years. Like I think there's going to be models. Years. I think there's going to be models in the next couple of years that are trained on just the, the, the farthest reaches of composition, harmony, they'll be able to anal do analysis both on musical and like the engineering level of all any record that you could ever imagine. And it'll be able to spit out convincing music in a particular style. But if that happens, wouldn't that leave performance as the final frontier? Like, be, like if that happened to where like, well, you, AI can just spit it out, then it's like, well, maybe then there would be a reason. Like if people are going on a stage and playing an instrument, that would be like the last thing an AI couldn't ever do. Yeah, you but know, the like, thing is, do you trust what you see on stage now? Well, if I'm there, I can usually okay. sniff it out. That ropes it up. That, that, so you just went right back. You brought it back to another point. Yeah, like what you just said. There's a whole, there's a, there's another negative byproduct of, of the 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 technic yep. the, the technological part of it um and i mean uh far be it for me to tell anyone what the fuck it is that they should do you know on stage or whatever like you know if you want like if, if that's the way that they want to do it it would seem that the overwhelming majority of people would prefer to be lied to these days but um <laughs> That being said, on the AI on the AI front, dude, trip out. Okay, so the other day I was on here teaching somebody, and um, there was this like thing that popped up for uh, it was like some AI assist thing that popped up as like an option, and I was like, "Huh, what the fuck is that?" You know, and I was just like, "Sure, I'll try it out and see what it's doing." And it, it was related to audio, you know, and I was just like, "Huh, is this like a thing that makes it to where, like, the original sound for musicians thing audio?" Because be nerdy but like zoom now right it'll look at all 32 channels or whatever fucking is coming off of your interface and cascade them in a way that is not representative of how they normally are which is why you had to use loop back as a thing to go all right i want these two inputs to go to this output and everything um and i was thinking oh it's this thing that's gonna make that easier and i hung up with a call um with this dude you know what I mean? That I was teaching. And eight minutes later, I got this email. And it was a summary of our fucking entire conversation in, in great detail. It said, meeting summary for Wes Houck Zoom meeting, 11-30-2023. Wes and Michael had a conversation about the mechanics of guitar, focusing on triads and the respective sounds. They also discussed audio issues related to Zoom for music practice and considered Skype as an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> towards towards the end they reflected on their history and planned their upcoming meeting um and dude and then it breaks it down into larger parts They're like check this out and i don't know how it knew this like maybe it, i could hear that he was like not playing something right but it said um um uh Let's explain the concept of consecutive voicings and how it could be played across three strings. Michael said, while struggling with it, attempted to play the chords Wes was demonstrating. Wes also explained the formula for different triads, such as major, minor, diminished, and augmented. By the end of the meeting, Michael had gained a better understanding of the guitar mechanics, but he still needed more practice to master it. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to sound crazy. If you think that there's not something doing that on your phone conversations with people, you're out of your fucking mind. If you think that, like, when you call someone, there's not a thing doing that. And yeah. I mean, I, whether where they store this information and how they determine, like, whether something would be like a threat, like, or something, like, if there was some, you know, some people communicating on the phone about doing something bad, you know what I mean? And like where some AI would determine, hmm, this is probably real and I should forward this to the FBI or whatever the fucking three letter agency it is. Right. You're out of your fucking mind. If you don't, if you think some crummy program like Zoom that you use to teach guitar lessons is 
has that <laughs> detailed of a breakdown of your conversation if you don't think that that's happening on your fucking phone conversations good luck well with i the mean rest 20 years it's you know? not a conspiracy theory it's already been proven that yeah. uh that all our stuff everything we do um on our phones ends up in the nsa and the and that their problem is they don't have enough people to go through the sheer amount of data they get from people and then that's actually what apparently that's what's difficult is like when you have a fucking tsunami of everybody's stupid conversation about their groceries and like talking about netflix and like whatever soccer game they took their kids to like hundreds of millions of people in this country at least talking about fucking nothing and then there's like one terrorist or something that's that the challenge of going through that stuff is even greater so maybe ai i'm sure you're right and i'm sure that there's an ai going through it making summaries and uh and like that's what i'm saying they're probably going forward to. it probably will help solve that problem of the nsa spying and not knowing what to do with that tsunami of information yeah yeah i mean um the that's what i'm saying they're like eventually there'll be something sophisticated enough to scrub a phone call and put it into it like oh this is this is some real shit right now and eventually you know like yeah, that that wasn't a joke <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah they're not they're not joking around about that they're really yeah. sending a hitman or whatever um, <laughs> but yeah dude like it like they it figured out right there i mean to some degree that like he was playing something wrong and was like huh and then and then put that in it in the meeting summary you know and i could see why someone would want that you know what i mean like someone like who wasn't teaching guitar lessons like it was some fucking you know like um i would want it in meetings you know why because yeah. i used to pay somebody to do that and i was was like god i'm paying a lot for this well there you go bro next time you're <laughs> on here you just hit that ai assist and you're gonna get an email eight minutes later yeah very detailed and it's yeah gonna tell you know you it's because like meetings man this is a good one, by the way. I gotta say, we're really, we're really. Fucking yeah, we, we just got right in from the get go. We're but, we're we talking about the church and old boogies, and now the NSA, the end of yeah, the world. Yeah, we're going in, dude. Fucking Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, look, man. Meetings are the worst, you know. And as far as like work goes, and me feeling like I'm using my time for the better of uh, my life and the lives of those people I care about, I feel like meetings are the worst use of my time because I just hate them. And I think a lot of people do too. And so much stuff gets talked about them that then part of what I hate about them is talking about shit and then people forget about it. And then it's like, why did we waste this time talking about this stuff? So having that AI do that is great because then nothing gets forgotten you don't just talk about shit like you're a bunch of potheads and then like yeah it would be really cool if we do this thing and then no one remembers like yeah so either pay somebody to sit there at all your meetings track everything you say and then take time to like put it together and make a summer that's expensive or get this ai to just do it in eight minutes fuck i'm with the ai yeah or you well, film yet it. That's where, yeah, and that's and that's and that's how they will continually gain more, eventually unmitigated access to you as a person. Like eventually, right? Like you're you're gonna have that implant in your eye. You know what I mean? And that <laughs> thing that me. like. And and they will sell it to you. They'll they'll sell it to you on the on the basis that you're gonna like. Th there will be some social repercussion for not having it, Dude, right? I, like in this in the they same will way. Will not need to sell it to me. You'll do that's, it. That's I'll crazy. I mean, well, I mean, I respect the fact that you're like, I'm give it to me now. Like, I mean, like if you know that about yourself, like that's that's yeah. Definitely... Look, I realize that the, everybody has their. This is kind of like risk tolerance, kind of stuff right like with investing or something or 
per, it's a personal belief thing. So where it's to the individual, like a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that for all the stuff that could go bad with people knowing with being tied into the network, like for real, like, yes, absolutely. Um, the, I guess I don't care about those bad things or I guess risk tolerance wise, I don't feel like the risk of it is great enough for me, for me to outweigh the benefit. Now, this is, we're talking about something that doesn't exist yet, right? So, well, they're doing human trials for Neuralink this year. Yeah, but it doesn't exist in a way that I can get on it. Right, right, so, right. But I mean, get in there, bro. No, <laughs> no, no, no. They're I, gonna, I, that's I'm not what I'm, that's what I'm on saying. Some, any trials, fuck that. Well, well, but the, the 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 advantage may be that in fucking like, you know, it, like, you know how God, I'm I'm going into another one here, but you know how because of the Rogan universe, like everyone's like, I should get on TRT. You know what I mean? And there's like all these <laughs> the fucking elk. people. They're gonna sell that too. They're gonna sell like this because, like we were talking about, there's all these people who who preemptively get on that stuff and fuck themselves up when they didn't need to like they just needed to take that anavar thing which is a receptor that makes testosterone go to certain tissues and areas in your body to repair it and stuff like you're making enough of it because but because the food supply is poison and there's fucking radio rf everywhere and everything it's fucked with your ability to like send it to the right places in your body that neuralink thing they're gonna it's it's gonna optimize like hormone shit in yes. your body. They're gonna fucking they're gonna figure that out too. Digitally it's also, deliver chemicals. Like yep. just yeah. They're gonna figure that out and they're also gonna make it like um like a security system. Like you have a you have like a collection of cells growing in this area. This might be cancer or whatever. You like they're gonna and everyone's gonna go. I'm a I'm a fool if I don't get this. You know what I mean? Like you haven't paid your ta you haven't paid your taxes, so your dopamine reward is is down twenty seven percent to go. get it there back it up is. to a hundred. There it is. There <laughs> it okay, is. So Straight that, up. That's, look, that's the that's the that, dude. It's coming. If it's that coming. was the if that was the risk though, then that's not worth the reward to me. So right. it's just risk reward. That's exactly what I'm but, talking about, though, A. All. Like, you may think, sit there and think of the novelty of being able to be superhuman as like the thing that would to do calculus, would, just like yeah. right, right. But but that's but that's the incentive. That's the thing that they cut they that they get you with, and then what you give up is everything else that you don't like, even think about. It's quite literally like the modern manifestation of selling your soul. You know, it's like like having an AI assistant do my meetings is not selling my soul no 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 of of like you know grab put implant electrodes into your brain and be able to perform concert violin without ever playing a having played a violin yes, let's that, say that that's is the 40 year the, that is the future version of selling your yeah, soul yeah. i wouldn't i would not agree to have anything implanted in me until there was sufficient right. like use case and it was in the world and we had like some some idea of what the what the actual risks are yeah yeah not some risks that the three of us on a call are right saying. yeah like like this thing exists this is where it's going because yeah i don't i don't want the irs shutting down my dopamine <laughs> Dude, I mean, like, here's here's the thing, too, and this is crazy to say. What I'm about to say is going to make it sound briefly like I like I condone this, and I don't. But, like, China accepted quite a long time ago that human people, like, humans, especially, you know, in a, in a population of a billion or more, are, are going to be fallible, selfish, gross, wasteful, shitty things so they've turned it into this whole system where there are repercussions for behaving poorly where you won't get to live in a certain community like you jaywalk fucking money is coming out of your account people live in this state of fear that makes them like behave in an, in an organized society at least or at least in an organized way that that the chinese government would prefer was implemented and 
like I'm again, I'm not sitting here and saying that I want that, but I do think it's remarkable that they just just they just figured it out. They're like, yep, everyone sucks. Everyone's gonna do the <laughs> shitty wrong thing, and the only way to fix it is by putting up guardrails, yeah. making it to where everyone is going to suffer and there's going to be a repercussion for doing something badly like you go to the kfc twice in a week your fucking score goes down you can't go rent a car you know what i mean like <laughs> like i'm serious dude I'm, I'm serious that's that's where that's and if you think that that Neuralink thing isn't exactly that that's another god dude you know how there's just all these people who just think Elon is just like the the dog's balls. Like, yes, yeah, so Elon, <laughs> the Elon cucks. Yeah, yeah. They just think he's the fucking greatest dude. You know that like Ron, Ron from Audio Hammer was telling me that they he has sent up like over twenty thousand of those those satellites now. So like in a sense, he's building the grid. You know what I mean? And he has clearance to send up like 40 more like that. That's the grid. The grid is up there. They're just putting these satellites all over the place, you know, and like um, that's going to be the way they see everything, the way they control everything. And then all that stuff will be, you know, part of the Neuralink thing, too. You'll be able to see fucking there. There's that guy, you know? Yeah, it's there. Yeah, All your there's... neural DSP presets are going to be in there. You can just fucking, you know. <laughs> yeah, think about it. Every, in every possible way, any, even anything that would be advantageous, they'll be able to do. Anything that would put you in a place where you were fucked will also be there too. Right. Yeah, just both going up. I mean, I had I was thinking like to get fun with it for a sec, a couple sick things that you could do. One, you could program MIDI from the brain, right? You could just be chilling and being like, singing in midi lines uh from afar but you could also like imagine if they got it it was so dialed in in like 20 30 50 years to where your whole nervous system you can like whatever it is that you can like get your body to do it can like you know have control over that imagine if just as people like you know throw their fucking axe effects tones on for like four bucks Imagine if people start like licensing biological actions that they can, that their muscle memory can do. So it's like, Oh, do you want to like play double kick? Like Alex Rudinger, like you for $4 an hour, like you can. Um, but then like once your tokens run out, you're back to just sucking at drums. Like <laughs> imagine that, like, like if people just start like licensing, like for some, paid amount of money per hour or whatever, like some task or thing that they do really well. I feel like it's going to come to that at some point. I'm sad. I won't get to see it. If it's, Oh dude, it's, no, no, be around. you just said it's going to be five years. I said 20 because like I look at, I kind of think of 20, 20 is 20 years ago is when I started like my adult life. And like right around then is when nine 11 happened. And then pretty much ever since then, like technology and surveillance and everything has just fucking like yep advanced in a way that is is hard to keep track of and um it goes without saying that there's all sorts of great things about it you know what i mean like um amber alerts and shit like that although i did see silver time, alerts what, too <laughs> you got to have the silver alerts what are silver alerts when a when an old person with alzheimer's run same idea, but it's for an old person who's basically disappeared. Oh Damn. no, shit! I've never seen. Yeah. I never got one of Me those. either. Yeah, well, they don't happen as much, but that's that's a silver alert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> hey, it's useful, man. Like life saving stuff. There's a handful of people right now that are a hundred percent with us when they were gonna watch this, and then there's a bunch of people who are bummed out. You know what I mean? Oh, well. <laughs> like, and it's entirely dependent on their age group, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, the 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 amount of I guess the amount of stuff that you know just everyone has seen change from that time frame of like two thousand eight, and just circling it back to music two thousand eight two thousand nine, like. Andy Sneap forum and anyone associated sort of with it. And that being like this repository of information about recording 
to like now, right? It's it's grown. I mean, dude, like URM was was so was maybe a twinkle in your eye at the time, and now it's like a thing, you know. And there's and it's gonna be a thing forever, you know. Like there's a whole community of people that are white knuckled waiting for the new shit to come out so they can learn <laughs> from it and everything. Um, I think it'll probably just be more like that, more like subscription based information stuff. And like you said, licensing Alex Rudinger's double stroke <laughs> technique, you know? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I, I think that the, the, it's going to be more and more and more about what the individual person can do as opposed to what they can consume of other people's music. So more about creating than consuming. It's already been going in that direction. Like we consume sure. other people's music a lot, of course. But, um, but I think that it's, it all, at least, uh, at least it seems to me like a big part of it is, uh, all about w how you can create is going to become more and more, uh, I guess, plentiful, robust, uh, and varied. And if you just think about like our genre, for instance, this, like there are metal fans who don't make music, right? Obviously Metallica can't have that many fans if they're all musicians, but the moment that you like get out of Metallica, and out of Slipknot and stuff, and you start to come back to like our world. Um, I think that the the percentage of the crowd that are made up of musicians grows by a lot. And the further down, the further down into the underground you get, the more and more and more you find that the metal crowd is basically musicians. I, yeah, I mean, I would go so far as to say that I don't know that there's another genre maybe outside of like jazz where like what percentage of the listening base is a musician playing that style of music, but I'm sure it depends. I mean, I think it has all to do with where the genre is relative to pop. Like in, in 1991, Metallica was like effectively a, I mean, pop in the sense of like the most popular band on earth, regard irrespective of a genre. So when that happens, you're going to have a huge portion of your fan base that doesn't know what a you know what a tube is, but I think as that you know dwindles down, inevitably the people that are in it the most are the people who are participating in it. But I mean, I don't know. There's definitely been a little bit of like a I don't know if you guys agree, but it seems like the past couple years there's kind of this like spike happening where I think I think people. At least I hope this is what happens. But I feel like people are starting to get kind of like desensitized and almost exhausted by just like very like, you know, clean, like corporate aesthetics. And I think people are going to like, I do see a little bit more of a rebellious kind of extreme attitude creeping into more popular styles. Like it's subtle, but I think it is happening. And if say metal blew up again, like it was in the 90s you would have a much larger portion of the population that didn't know what a DAW is or what a pickup is or whatever. I think, I think it has a lot to do with where the genre is relative to other styles, you know, like on the pop spectrum. So you need MGK to make a death metal album? Not him. Um, maybe some like, I think, I mean, I think, the more girls that get into the into metal, the better. And I mean, like, actually, like, you know, because there, there's a, such a huge portion of the population of girls who love heavy music. And that just seems to be, you know, notoriously, like, in pop circles and more popular styles, like, that tends to help. And I think the more, the more cool girls that get into good metal, the, you know, will save us all um, at... At worst, it can be just like a, an accessory or a keychain as a style, which happens too. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I or Jason what... Momoa could start a death metal band. Yeah, it would That's suck probably... though. Well, would I'm suck. sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if you're just talking about getting non-musicians into metal, that's all I'm saying. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, but I do think like the more popular a style becomes, the more of the audience base has nothing to do with yeah being a musician, sure. you know. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there's heavy metal now for like, you know, like people who get good grades and you know, <laughs> and, there and like. Is. <laughs> You know, have come from like really great loving families and shit, and that wasn't the case before. No, you know? definitely not. No. Um, yeah, I think I, I think that um, the girl things probably uh, it's inarguable, right? You know, there's there's even parts of like older bands you know what i mean that have been around that noted right there's that part in year and a half the second part where lars they're in that back locker room you know what i mean they got the towels on he was like he's like i looked out there and i saw the crowd was fucking like 40 percent girls tonight he's like that's a new thing you know and like i mean so it (laughs) it was something that people were talking about even way back then um so yeah i mean it it um more of a more of i guess a fan base that is less involved with like the the machine the pieces the nomenclature like yeah. how it's put together and don't feel like that they have necessarily a stake and you know well and that's where all the the illusion is like that's the thing i feel like the illusion's gone when it's, you're at a show and just everyone's there like like knowing how exactly how everything's done like it's it's at its best when like people are like what is this you know like when you were 8 you heard something you were like what is this I was eight, you know, and, and i went to see morbid angel yeah there you go and i'm no, sure it never happened you were yeah. eight no no i'm just kidding i was oh. just <laughs> thinking like who did i see that blew me away back in the day but i wasn't right. eight yeah it's it's a thing though i think it's like the stronger the I illusion saw Paul is abdul when i was eight no shit yes that's true not my choice <laughs> just <gotta> say. <laughs> I mean, that would have been pretty cool. It was pretty cool, yeah. but not my choice. I think people will continually, like forever, you know what I mean? We'll probably romanticize the past, you know? Like eventually there's going to be people that are, you know, like youngsters. Now, he put me onto this one. There's this There's this little boy. He's probably got to be ever six years old. Oh, my that, God, dude. <laughs> I don't know where he's oh, from in, in Asia, but he's a I mean, very little boy, and like, he is like <laughs> he is the guitar is too big for him, but like the way he can play it, like in spite of that, is you're like they're coming, dude. There's is a it new, good. For, there's a good new, for a kid or good? Oh no no, no 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 no! Like I mean, like the things he's. I mean, you, you, there's a layer to where you could you could nitpick certain things, but those are all things that will like the second his hands grow another two inches, he's gonna be just like okay. like he's playing yeah. things with a certain amount of conviction, and like whoever's behind that camera, I mean, I imagine they're like programming him with the sickest licks and and like stuff to learn, but I mean, he is. Yeah, I think it's the dad, and the dad definitely fact, has sick guitars. Find, They're yeah, very yes. That's another thing. He plays sick guitars. Let me find this kid's name. Hold on. Because you know, sometimes yeah, kids, you see these videos of kids playing, and everyone's like, "Wow, they're so great!" And it's like, actually, kind of sucks. No, 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 no. This is not one of those. This okay. kid, this kid, you'd see him, and you would be like, "Hey, I'm gonna send okay. you this, this dude right now." No, you I know, mean, I, I, this is not news to me because my dad. Uh, would always, not always, like once a year, um, there back when he was the music director in Atlanta, like once a year you'd get a child prodigy coming through. It'd be like some eight year old from Prague or like some you know nine year old from Korea or something like that. It, they'd come through with like their trainer, uh, well, teacher and um, parents, and it would. You know, it's like a fucking nine-year-old or seven-year-old playing a Beethoven piano concerto. It's freakish shit. They weren't as good as the adults, but I mean, still, like, yeah, better than most people. And uh, it's a thing. You know, child prodigies are a thing. Yeah, I mean, like the there's there's like the part 
there's the part of like executing and playing something and then there's this part of doing that and doing it with like a level of conviction that only comes from being old enough to have your heart broken or go through things that were very shitty and make you you know sound like you know mm -hmm. you've 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 got some stamps on your passport like you've been around the fucking world and like this little boy right now while he might not have all of that is is definitely Which is a good thing like, you could sit there and you're kind of like oh yeah dude he's coming he's coming and he's coming fast and probably in about two years because kids grow like once 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 kids hit like 11 or 12 years old it's boom it's like they're you know it's this window of time where their brains are malleable and um they can not only learn but like make advancements in like strength and shit like that like my my youngest he's like in pretty sick shape right now like he's you know like like and and just two years ago there was a a, a video of him on my phone and he had like a little high voice and he had like chubby cheeks and stuff <laughs> like that and everything like that and he's He's like a man now, you know? Um, so you pair that with like, you know, staying in the church and being sick at guitar and also having a dad that's breaking you off on great shit, you know? And here's there's something that he's brought up too. And I think that he's in a way experienced some of this. When I was, when I was growing up, like there, there wasn't, you didn't go on your computer or your phone and have like hundreds of videos of Guthrie Gubman playing, you know, oh. and 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 you could see what that was like, you know. Um, this generation has had it, you know, like and and that part of it, you know, has has, has I think made advancements pretty quick. Like there weren't a lot of times for anyone to pick up any bad habits, you know. There was just a a, a wealth of guitar instruction stuff that was much better than the stuff you'd find in some crappy glossy page you know magazine um right and that part of it i think is probably going to make a a, a real gener like this new generation is are going to be some real maniacs you know as far as playing goes i think we'll probably see shit i mean even with him obviously now you see shit he plays and you're just like oh my fucking god i can't believe that's real that's gonna be there's it's gonna it's it's gonna happen it's gonna there's there's gonna be people who like eventually like they'll think of him as like Jimmy Page, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, hope so. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I mean, dude, there, well, it's really like when you don't have it I mean, dude, because I have some students who are I mean, when they don't have any bad habits and you teach them the good stuff, they can just do it. You know, like, like what we were doing on zoom the other night, all that shit about like muting and all that pick angle stuff. Like there are some kids who like, don't like even have a reference for like how to hold a pick. And when you show them that, that's just like what they do, you know, because it's raw muscle memory that's ready to be programmed. So that's, I think how it goes, the more extreme that stuff gets and the more of an empty canvas people are going into it when they're just like, Oh, who's this, you know? Uh, yeah. Who's this like, gonna get into guitar who's the steven toronto guy you know like i'm a, like like when the reference is just these stupidly extreme benchmarks you end up it's just how it goes but to your point though there is the the danger for the conviction to get lost along the way and i mean that's the thing you got to be like on check with because yeah uh, I yeah. wonder, yeah, I mean, like my my favorite guitar players, it seems like every one of them has had a problem with booze. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> every every fucking one of yeah. them. Yeah. My mine it's either drugs or mental illness, like some sort of depression where they wanted to end themselves or booze and depression or booze and drugs or like tragic life stories or not tragic but like just mental health that you know problems yeah um that's definitely that's a real thing and that neuralink thing 
that'll probably make it to where no one is mentally ill anymore. You know? Well, yeah. Or it'll, it'll be find like new that. Ones. It'll be, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there'll be like a new type, but like that yeah. whole what was that Christian Bale movie where like it came out around the same time as like the Matrix and it had like I know what you're talking with about. guns and shit and they like <laughs> so like it didn't end up being as big as the Matrix because they came out around the same time, but like they everyone has to take like a a, a drug to make it to where they are they're emotionless equilibrium is that yeah, equilibrium it? that's the yeah one. yeah um and as a result like it's like a totally peaceful organized clean society and they like go and find people who quit taking the drug you know what i mean and they find them in like a room with like paintings and like music <laughs> and shit and they just fucking like shoot them and burn them and <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> if Maybe i could th- take if some implant could fix my brain to where my clinical depression was gone. I'd sign up for that. I that one, if that was the benefit, um, I would take any of those risks that we coming. talked about earlier. Like I mean, if it was able to that's fix that's probably coming. Them, yeah, dude. If it was able to fix that, like for sure, your depression will be over because this has been a lifelong thing. Like I would totally take the risks. Fuck sign me the fuck up for that that would be great yeah it's i think it's common i mean yeah not like not the oh you'll be able to play like a concert violinist or like alex rudinger that is not enough for me to sign up for the risks but if it was able to like fix my brain chemistry yeah i mean it's gonna fucking it's, it's adding a digital interface to chemical delivery you know it's like sign me up yeah. If it'll if it will fix my depression, sign me up, hundred percent. Yeah, we'll have to see how it plays out. Satan, right? please. <laughs> I mean, he's he, yeah, he's he's pulling the strings, right? Yeah, man, Satan, like, we'll kill God together. Like, <laughs> <laughs> who cares? I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't know if I'm necessarily super comfortable with talking about, like mental health like related to myself on like a on a podcast i've, or I've mentioned but it I, before but, but i don't so. necessarily i don't know if i would like i don't know if i would do the same I, I don't know if i would give up everything um just to fix that e- even though it is you know it would it would be amazing that is something that like there's just such a massive trade-off with it but eventually yeah the brody from rivers he's always said he's like like people who say that they won't do it it's like you'll be begging for it you'll be begging for it like you fucking want the new iphone you know what i mean like you'll be like yeah. oh look at these features you know like um yep. so it's possible i could be full of shit <laughs> i could just end up fucking getting in line and getting it um <laughs> but the church still has got to be a you know still got to be a part of it you know yeah the church is the alamo it's like the haven. Yeah. All right. So one last question, then I got to go. And because uh, we're a little over time. Yeah. R.E. the church. So on days like Mondays and Tuesdays where you do gear shit and then Wednesdays through Sundays when you teach. So none of that stuff's church time. Uh, how and when do you work that in? There's just less church time during those days. You know what I mean? Like the the Wednesday through Sunday type of thing. I I guess as things get refined, like with the rig or whatever, or it's like, oh, we're not, we're not going out and we're not playing new songs on this one. So I don't have to necessarily worry about like, you know, going and making new sounds on my axe effects for it or spending any time like preparing for the show it's just going to be like a a a setting that we've already done before um then i can spend more time in the church COVID, particularly churchy time um probably just because like i didn't i didn't have to worry about having a band ready to tour yet you know and i mean now it's literally like it's one of those things where it's like okay i gotta worry about like you know the some 
anomalous piece of gear like the X32 now. You know what I mean? It's like where there's all these different fucking functions and things that can go wrong with your AES connection to the X32 and some other board and like that type of shit, you know, where I hate that's one part I hate about it. Like it is is that nowadays you're kind of expected to in order to put on that kind of show and when your band lives all over the fucking place like mine like the best thing that you can possibly do is like have everyone with ears and everyone kind of get do all their homework to a show file you know because it's not like it's not like all we all live in the same town and we can get together several times a month and 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 play you know although there's there seems to be a handful of people that like uh that do that you know um but they do all live they they do all live in the same area code or at least the you know right. the same city i'm jealous that, yeah your fucking band lives in europe or Jeez. like half of them <laughs> yeah one in texas one in boston one in atlanta me in milwaukee two in austria it is what That's it is insane. how many people is that Six. Six? Yeah. Okay. Who lives in Texas? Jesse. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I mean... Um, a lot of motherfuckers. Yeah, six is a lot. It's a yeah. lot of people. I think that I think that the show part of this, though, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if it's ever going to go out of, out of style. I could be wrong on that. I could, I could end up being a thing where only, like, certain people end up being able to afford to tour like big you know like big bands and there won't really be like club shows anymore i could see a possibility of that in the future but like i you know we're not there yet people still really like the shows you know thankfully so i think i think the more a like the, the faker it gets and the more the more like streamline it gets i do think there could be i, I think that could be the, the place people go actually to like breathe again to be like all right like you know i could like a much more sick version of like when vinyl came back for three years you know in 2019 you know like a much more like reason to be there version of that you know i could see that being the truth well dudes i have to uh end this but i want to thank you both we have an ep coming out called death is but a door on january 12th uh go and pick that thing up from nuclear blast and uh we're going on tour a whole shit load in the beginning of 2024 uh going out in january with bail and Maya. we're playing milwaukee metal fest we're playing a, a shadows fall uh war within 20th anniversary show and then we have a tour coming out in the summer that hasn't been announced yet that should be a real real barn burner so uh thanks for everyone for coming out to see us so far and everyone who's picked it up so far boom done